and welcome to another episode of PDA Dad UK. Before I go on, please, can you hit like, hit subscribe and ring that bell so that you know when I've got new content coming up. I've got loads of interesting topics coming up and some fantastic interviews as well. I want to talk to you this week on a really difficult subject and it's the subject of ABA or Applied Behavioural Analysis. Now, this is a topic that comes up a lot on my group on Facebook. And the problem is that ABA is a form of therapy that's often used with autistic kids. It's particularly espoused by probably the most famous of the autism advocacy groups. And I use the term advocacy very, very liberally in that. And that is Autism Speaks. The problem is that ABA is actually an abusive therapy and it, it's, it's one of those things that it appears on the surface to be very helpful and very useful and as a neurotypical when, when you read these things and the, the benefits that ABA produces it's very alluring. It's got that very attractive shell to it but when you peel away just a little bit beneath the surface you start to uncover the issues with ABA so I'm going to go into that and talk about the problems that ABA presents and why it's something that we shouldn't be inflicting on any autistic person and and why it is so it's why autism speaks is so reviled by the actually autistic community and I've had the chance to, to speak to a lot of autistic people and it's almost a universal thing I don't know anybody who is actually autistic who supports what Autism Speaks do and the reason that they are so against Autism Speaks is because Autism Speaks promote the use of applied behavioral analysis ABA therapies so what is ABA? ABA is a therapy that basically aims to reduce autistic traits. So stimming is a really good example. Stimming is something that is harmless, as long as it's not self-harming. Um, there is a case where stimming can be self-injurious and if you watch my video on stimming, we go into that. But stimming in itself as an everyday thing is actually a really helpful thing. It actually promotes mental health and emotional and basically reduces anxiety and promotes emotional well-being within people and we all stim in one way or another. I spoke to uh, my friend Ben who you can watch that interview here as well and he was saying that basically stimming can be anything. If we go shopping uh, to make ourselves feel better, if we dig into a cake because we're feeling low and we're using that food to, to make us feel a bit better, anything like that's a form of stimming. It's a physical action that's helping to regulate our emotional state. Stimming can be something that appears to be quite uncomfortable. And this is the problem that we have. We live in a predominantly neurotypical world. And what I mean by that is that the majority of people are neurotypical. We're starting to see more and more that actually autism and neurodiversity is something that's really widespread and probably far more common than people realize. But it's still that sort of thing where we live in a world that is predominantly neurotypical. And the result is that we tend to push the neurotypical way of doing things as being the right way of doing things. It's an easy trap to fall into and it's something that we all do one way or another. And certainly I was very guilty of this before becoming a parent to an autistic child. The thing with something like stimming is that because it's, it uses that physical uh, interaction so kids can spin around, people will shake their hands, they will vibrate, they'll rock. Uh, is a really common one. They might chew on things. There's a whole host of different stims that are, are out there. And they're actually not harmful in any way. They're not causing anybody any harm. They're not actually causing any distress. What they're actually doing is helping the person doing it and probably preventing something worse from happening if they're regulating emotions that can stop you from leading to a meltdown or a shutdown or whatever the case may be. The problem is that because we view it as something that's different, it feels wrong. It's a natural emotion, and I'm not trying to judge anyone for feeling that, and certainly it's something that I've been guilty of in the past myself, as I say. I say this as somebody who's been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and I'm learning that that's not the right way to do things. It's what's led to so many of the societal issues that we have today, racism, sexism, homophobia, anything like that. They're all things that have come from not understanding a way of doing things and assuming that our way is right. And so stimming looks awkward. It can be socially embarrassing for us as a parent, but we've just got to get over that to some degree. 
And so what happens is that therapies like ABA come along and the idea is that they're going to repress these, or re they, they say reduce these traits. The problem is the therapy itself is very aggressive and very abusive. Now, not all ABA therapy comes under that banner. The ABA is a funded therapy and often to get around taxation issues and stuff like that, things get listed as ABA. It can be very hard to pick. My recommendation is if they're associating themselves with ABA, avoid because you just don't want to put your kid through what ABA can create. So it's probably best to explain how I came across ABA and why I learned that it was such a bad thing. I run a group on Facebook, we talk about it quite a bit. Uh, we're 30,000 members nearly, and there's a lot of people on there who will often question ABA. Is there something we should be doing? We've been recommended this, we've been told about this. I'm fortunate enough that I have a number of actually autistic friends, and I've said in so many episodes, if you don't talk to actually autistic people, you're not gonna be able to help your kid to exist in this world, because we can't understand from inside the box. We need to be able to, you know, if I want to understand the mechanics of a car, I talk to a mechanic because a mechanic's going to know better than me what it is. I'm not just going to stumble in and, and try. I'm not going to ask my mate who's a computer programmer how to fix my car. He's not going to know that. You know, you go to the people who actually know. And if you're autistic, you actually understand and you know you're living inside that box. It's such a valuable resource and I can't recommend it enough. Get talking to actually autistic people. There's hashtags on Twitter for actually autistic, um, asking autistics. There's a whole load of different options that you can go for to, to find this information out. Hit Facebook, actually address autistic people. You'd be surprised how many people there are out there who are actually autistic and you probably wouldn't know. It's just something that goes on behind the scenes in their minds and you know they, they live perfectly average lives like the rest of us. So. I was able to engage with some actually autistic people. And what I discovered was that ABA therapy was something that's really, really highly disregarded among the autistic community. And the problem is that it does repress these traits. So we talked about things like, stimming is just a really great example because it's something that's not harmful to anyone as long as it's not self-injurious. It's just something that's done that helps regulate emotion, but it's awkward for us. And so the temptation is to repress it. And this is what ABA will do. The first way they do this is with a, a method called compliance training. And this is where it is actually, and it often involves a physical intervention. If someone's stimming, they'll hold, no, you've got to stop this. And it's like a repetitive training, almost like you train a dog. No, bad, you know, and, and they push through this stuff so that the stimming stops. The, the child in question learns it's bad, it's not the right thing to do, and they start repressing it. The problem with repressing things like that is it's going to lead to major problems down the track. The reason for this is because it's not being replaced with anything healthy. So if there's, the example I'll give is that if, you're, if, if your child's experiencing a self-injurious stint, they might be banging their heads uh, or grinding teeth or something like that, where it's, it's going to potentially lead to some self-injury in some way then you look to divert the stim to something that's more healthy. So maybe shaking hands or something like that, finding another stim that they enjoy and then coaxing in that direction. So you're not wiping out the stim altogether. You're just keeping them safe from harm. You're finding something else to bring in that has the same calming effect. The problem with just repressing the stim altogether is that that anxiety just gets built up inside. We've all experienced this in one way or another. We, we pushed back. You hear about it with people who've gone through grief and they don't deal with it at the time. Uh, I was really interested in talking to a friend of mine who's the guitarist for Fallen State by, uh, by the name of Dan Oak. He was on my other channel, The Grumpy Dads, and we were talking about it, and he was diagnosed with cancer. He had lung cancer, and he had to go and have his lung removed. And he just kind of got on with it. He pushed it all back, just got on with it. And when lockdown hit and he was alone, and, and it all came bubbling to the surface and he actually realized he moved into a form of depression at the time because he hadn't dealt with it adequately at the time. It's, it's that kind of thing. When we repress things that need to be expressed, we need to express them healthily, but they need to be expressed nonetheless. And what happens with a lot of autistic people who've experienced ABA, and this is, I'm gonna put a bunch of links in the description for this, which we'll go through. One in particular, which was from a lady who was, she's called the Anxious Advocate. And she put, a, she was an ABA therapist herself. And she put this fantastic article up that explained why she left ABA therapy. 
And it was because she as a therapist herself had been doing these techniques under the illusion that she was helping. And that was what I really loved is that she came from that perspective that I was trying to help and I was told this was a way I could help. This is something I could do that would support other. And it was all about care. She wasn't being malicious in being involved with ABA. She was genuinely trying to help. And everything she'd found initially was so positive. She'd look through all the articles and, oh, ABA does this. It's sort of, you know, it's the wonder drug, if you like, that's going to cure everything. But once she got involved, she started investigating below the surface more and discovered the actually autistic community who were talking about this and the damage it had done. And what was happening was that she was inflicting these therapies. And I use inflicting because that's how it's like for the person receiving them. When you're forced not to be able to do something, you're oppressing it. It can be, it, for, for an autistic person, it can actually be a physically painful thing. To stop someone stimming, it can be painful. A great example is eye contact. So we often think that we need to have eye contact. It's, it's how they're addressing. A lot of autistic people don't need eye contact. They don't like eye contact. Actually, making eye contact can be physically painful. So it's, it's one of those things, it's, it's hard to understand for, for us as neurotypicals because we make contact, that's how we address someone. And for me, it's like, oh, I'm looking at you, I'm making eye contact, that's how I'm going to show that I'm paying attention, I'm listening. It's almost like it's good manners. However, for an autistic person, and this is not all autistic people, not, not all autistic people can't make eye contact or don't want to make eye contact, but it is a very common thing. And the reason they don't want to make the eye contact is because it causes discomfort. And the autistic brain just works differently to the neurotypical brain. It's why it's called neurodivergence. We are neurodiverse people. There are people of all kinds of different neurology. And forcing someone to make eye contact can actually, the way the autistic brain processes it, it can feel painful. So we talked about sensory processing disorder in a few episodes now. And it can be related to that, just the way that the brain processes that. It translates that discomfort into a physical pain. And so she was finding that she was forcing them to make eye contact. And they have this thing within the ABA therapy world that they will, you, once you've started something, you have to continue it. So you can't allow it to, you know, once you've stopped them stimming, you can't let them restart stimming. And you have to physically stop them every time. And what was happening is that these, these things were all being repressed inside. And then it's 10, 15, 20 years down the track they have to surface in some way. And they were surfacing with mental health issues for a lot of people. A lot of actually autistic people have clicked into things like bipolar disorder, gone into depression, are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder. Because of the experiences they've had with ABA in the past, it creates this anxiety that's never dealt with. And so it builds and builds and builds. And we're living in a society now that talks about, we need to be open. We need to be open about our mental health. We need to talk about it. ITV have, you know, get Britain talking. We see loads of different charities and, and all sorts of things that are really pushing to make mental health a big thing. And we often talk, we need to talk about it because keeping it inside is unhealthy. But using stimming as the example again, stimming is a healthy way of expressing an anxiety and dealing with it. It's just a physical way of doing it. It's the same as me doing some retail therapy and going to the shops or me picking up my guitar. For me, I love playing guitar. It really helps me. It centers me. I feel it's my, my own time and I can express my emotions in my music. And I love that. If someone took that away from me and forced me to not be able to do that, I would really struggle. Music got me through a whole load of di difficult and dark times in my life. And without it, I'd be a mess. Repressing, stimming, repressing or forcing things like eye contact, stopping tiptoe walking, anything like that can be really harmful. Now, sometimes things like tiptoe walking can relate to hypermobility and that maybe needs to be addressed. You don't want physical harm coming. But just forcing someone to stop walking on their tiptoes is the wrong way to go about it. We're actually causing so much more distress to our kids and we, you know, and this is a point I really want to make, and it's a point I'd like to address with the actually autistic audience out there, the people who are listening, who are autistic themselves. And we go in as parents, and this is the understanding that we need, is that I do everything I can to make my daughter's life better. I have this mantra, which is I want to make tomorrow better than today. And I will look for ways that I can do that. And when you're new on the journey into understanding autism, 
you make mistakes. And so, and, and the problem is that so much of this is presented as being such a great thing. And it's presented by, you know, when you look up ABA, you, you'll find a whole load of things first that basically talk about how wonderful it is and what wonderful thing it's done, what, what wonderful things it's done for, for our families. And you go, oh, wow, I'm gonna look into that. And it's very, very difficult because we're being presented with this stuff as being a great way to go. And it's not until we dig under the surface a bit more that we find that there are all these issues. Understanding that parents can be in the beginning of a journey is so important. Your, your feedback is so needed, but addressing it in a way that supports and I know you're trying to help your child. This is my experience of ABA, or these are the people I know who've had to endure ABA, and these are the problems it's had down the track. As I say, reading this article from The Anxious Advocate was just magic because I got to see from the inside why she'd become an ABA therapist. She was trying to help, she was trying to promote well being, and, and she, she loved the kids she was working with. She genuinely thought she was helping. As she dug below the surface, she found that she wasn't helping and she was actually causing more problems. And to her credit, she left it all behind and she moved on and she's done things like this article and she's actually getting the message out there to the wider community that autism is not something that needs to be repressed. We need to work with our autistic kids to help them to be accepted for who they are not force them into a mold that doesn't fit. So for parents watching and trying to understand ABA and, and help your kids, I can't say enough to just avoid ABA therapies. Our goal should not be to force our kids to conform to what we, what the world considers, what the neurotypical world considers to be the right way to do things. What we should be doing is looking to help the neurotypical world understand that there's no right or wrong way to do certain things. And just because it's something that we may not find comfortable, something that we may not understand, doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make it the wrong thing. My rule of thumb is if it's causing harm to somebody else or to themselves, that's where I will step in. So if my daughter's in a violent meltdown and she's attacking people, I will step in to stop her because I can't have other people being hurt and she's gonna wind up hurting herself. However, if my daughter, my daughter's stimmy, she plays with her hair, she twirls it, it's harmless and it's actually, you know, in the world of stims, really minor. You probably wouldn't even notice it. One other stim that she has, which is more noticeable, is she sings. She will sing loudly and, and it's just her way of relaxing herself. And you know when she's anxious because she starts singing louder and louder and louder. She's fi finally learning to sing in tune, which is wonderful because before that was a particularly difficult thing for me, especially as a musician. I found that really challenging, but uh, her stimming is, is, you know, this hair twirling and she will um, sing. And she likes pressure as well. She'll find herself things and she'll, she'll squeeze and stuff like that. They're, they're fairly minor in the world of, you know, stims, but when we see kids who are physically reacting, we don't need to stop that. If they're shaking, they're shaking. If they're rocking, they're rocking. It's not causing anybody any harm. And that's my rule of thumb. If it's not harming somebody else, I'm not going to step in and I'm not going to change it because it's just helping. Other people need to learn to be understanding and accepting. And actually recognise that this is, this may not be something we're used to, but that doesn't mean it's something that's wrong. The problem that a lot of autistic people have is that autism isn't visible. It's not something that's usually really overt and obvious. It sits under the surface and it's not visible to the naked eye. You can't just go, oh, that person is autistic. What that means is that, you know, if you've got somebody who's in a wheelchair and they're rocking, or that, that, that are clearly disabled, no one's going to address it. It's like, oh, well, you know, clearly they're disabled. The problem is with it not being visible is that we then apply a whole world of societal, society, socially acceptable norms into their life. And we're saying, well, they should be behaving this way. They should be making eye contact. They should be, you know, not stimming. They shouldn't be shaking like that. They shouldn't be singing out loud. And what we're doing is inflicting so much pain on these people and it's leading to these mental health issues down the track. It's leading to so many problems that don't need to be there. I want my daughter to grow up and to be healthy and happy. And
part of that is that she's going to be autistic, healthy and happy because she is autistic. And I want her to be healthy and I want her to be happy. If her stimming causes somebody else discomfort, well, learn to live with it. Because I'm not going to stop her doing that. When we inflict these therapies on other people, they, they harm because they are forcing something that needs to be addressed at the time to not be addressed. They're stimming for a reason. They're rocking for a reason. They might be feeling anxious. And it's the body's way of stopping them moving to the next level of anxiety, which is usually a meltdown or a shutdown. Now, what would you rather, somebody rocking, or would you rather somebody that was lashing out or completely comatose, not moving? Because they're the, sort of the options that present themselves. I'd much rather my daughter was singing, playing with her hair, shaking, rocking, whatever she needs to do, if that's helping her deal with the anxiety at the moment. The basic lesson that I, I really can't express strongly enough is go out and talk to autistic people. Go out and look for articles like that. Don't just assume something's okay. The temptation is we hit Google and we type in ABA or Applied Behavioural Analysis. And then we look at a few articles and it's all positive and that's great. So we can go ahead with it. What we need to do is counter that. So it's just as easy to Google problems with Applied Behaviour Analysis. And when we do that, that's when we start to see these other articles coming up that people have written uh, or videos that people have made, there's plenty on YouTube as well, where people are expressing the problems with ABA. And it's it, it does create so much damage down the track. I don't want my daughter suffering from PTSD. I don't want my daughter's autism to develop into something that could be it's so much worse, like you know bipolar disorder, and we've got that in the family. It's something that can happen. In fact, a doctor, when I, when I, when we, I took my daughter to the hospital, I've talked about this in previous episodes, once he identified that she was autistic, which he did very quickly, he said that we need, you know, you need to get this addressed. Make sure you are following up and getting a diagnosis because so often autism, particularly in girls, will develop to further conditions. You never stop being autistic, but then you develop other conditions like bipolar disorder down the track because it hasn't been addressed. And it's often because girls mask, and masking is a form of, of self-inflicted ABA therapy in some ways. It's basically conforming to the social norms around you that you see. In the meantime, you're bodily repressing, and then that explodes later on because it just can't be managed over time. You can't keep all that stuff inside. Research properly, make sure that you're looking for the positives because it, you know, and it's sometimes these things you need to sort of make a, a an educated decision about what is the, the, the pros and the cons, what's going to work out best. But ABA is one that I can't say strongly enough. Look at the cons and understand that the actually autistic people who've experienced ABA are all almost universally saying, do not use ABA. It's caused so many more problems down the track. We need to be a world, we have, you know, the world talks constantly at the moment about acceptance and diversity and how it's such a positive thing. And we need to embrace that with neurodiversity as well. It's not just about accepting all races. It's not just about accepting all sexualities. It's not just about accepting whatever gender you, you are. All these things are so important. We're all human beings. But neurodiversity is something that needs to be understood and accepted as well. It's just a different way of perceiving the world and trying to force into a box is just the wrong way to go. And without autistic people, we, there's so many progressions that could have been made and couldn't have been made in the world without them. And there's so many famous people who are, you know, identifying as autistic now. Jerry Seinfeld, you've got the governess from the, the chase, you've got Dan Aykroyd, you've got, it's just so many people who fit into that. And a lot of comedians are actually autistic because they just have that different way of looking at the world. It's not something we should be repressing, we should be celebrating autism. Uh, if I could make that a hashtag and get people doing that, celebrate autism, I think that would be a fantastic thing. That's what I want to really say. Do look at the articles that I've got in the description. There'll be a bunch of links in there uh, to articles which talk about ABA and the harm it's done. Thanks for watching. Please do like this video. Please do subscribe and please do comment. If you're an autistic person who's been through ABA therapy, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to perhaps down the track do some interviews with some actually autistic people to talk about their experiences and actually get this out there as a message more and more. If you're a parent of a child and you've been tempted to use ABA, 
I'd love to hear from you as well. Not, not for judgment or anything like that, but I want to be able to hear the other side of it and what your emotions were and the reason that you pursued this. Because my experience is parents don't do this to harm their kids, they're trying to help their kids. But it's being, uneducated is the wrong word, not given the full details at the start. And we go into these things with the best of intentions and then realize down the track we've made a mistake. I'd love to hear from you. Please do subscribe, please do ring that bell, you'll always know when new content's coming up. Stay safe everyone, and I will see you again next time.